Greg Garza joining us for the Friday Free Kick. Good morning, sir. Cheers to a good Friday, sir. How you doing? All right. So you got the you have the the Sholo Smug rocking this morning. I see how this works. There it is. Uh, that there. Yep. yep. Uh, oh, the personalized Sholo Smug. Personalized. How does these this are, happen? These are. This is when I got to be a part of putting a star on this uh, on this crest uh, as well. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm down. I'm down with that. All right. So we've got a, we've got a couple of different things to to get into this morning for a couple of different reasons. And, and since it is and since it is Friday and since it is uh, a Friday leading into the Easter weekend, our original question on the board, our QOD, Easter candy, and it has to do with the Easter candy that you cannot live without. And the Easter candy that you're like, nope, you can have it. I don't want it. I ain't touching it. Nothing happening. You can have it and you can take all of it. What falls into those categories for you? Okay. Easter candy that I cannot live without uh, would be the bunny, like Reese's, the Reese's uh, cups, like the bunny. Attaboy. Atta boy, the Reese's eggs. That yes. is what I, I, that's where I am anyway. And I the know ones that I you can get far away from me are the peep marshmallows. Peeps okay. can't do the peeps. My son, my oldest son, whose birthday is today. Uh, my oldest son, he's uh, he, he loves those darn things. I don't know how they eat them. It just tastes like uh. plastic plastic uh, dye to me for some reason. Well, no, you're not you're not you're not wrong in that regard because. The the all of the the sugar and everything that just wraps itself around it with the food coloring and, and everything like that. Don't get me wrong, I love marshmallows. I don't know if I'd be a person that would eat marshmallows just just the marshmallow by itself. I feel like I if I have a marshmallow, it's got to go with something else. So I guess maybe that's my maybe that's my flaw right there and not wanting a, a a peep. Right? Maybe if it was in two graham crackers and a piece of chocolate. See then... <laughs> now you're. Now you're getting someplace. That to me, uh, I mean, it, it is absolutely tremendous. Now that that's very, very well, very well placed. I can't do the peeps. Do, by the way, that reminds me. Did you see? Have you? I don't know when the last time was you were in a grocery store, but I guess because of the season that's, that we're in. Every <laughs> did you did you see the peeps flavored Pepsi? No, I haven't seen these peeps flavored Pepsi products. Yeah. I, I mean, no, I, 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 I yeah, way I, I ran away in fear. I, I was, completely yeah. <laughs> and so when you go into the grocery store, you go down the, 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 the soft drink aisle, it is literally Pepsi in an, in a yellow can. That is the, that is to differentiate the, wow. the peeps flavored Pepsi. And I was, I was completely and totally re, just repulsed and ran the other way. I, I honestly, I, I don't even think I, I maybe had Pepsi maybe once or twice in my whole entire life. Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know too many people who would buy a, a, a Pepsi. Um, <laughs> maybe that's just me, but, but I mean, down in Texas, we call everything Coke anyway, right? Uh, you, you want a Coke, you still, you drink a Sprite, it's still a Coke. So exactly. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. No, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. But no, I used to be a Pepsi guy, but obviously, you know, I've, I've, I've gravitated toward Mountain Dew and stuff like that. But, um, but I know no, that's your go-to. It is. It is. And it's right <laughs> over there. And the, the irony, because I'm on the road. Are you in, uh, are you in, where are you right now? New York? I, I'm at, no, I wish. No, Jason is on his way to New York at some point later today. I am in Tifton, Georgia, making my way to the in-laws. Oh, okay. All right. Making, I've, your, uh, making your way. So with Tifton, Georgia, what? That's a couple hour drive. Yeah. Uh, here's okay. here's here's what happened. So uh, Open Cup, and we'll get into Open Cup as well coming up as a part of the conversation today. Open Cup was in Statesboro on Wednesday, and uh, Open Cup that was uh, RGV out of USL Championship against South Georgia Tormenta down in Statesboro, yes. and so I was at that match, and you know it's a four and a half hour drive from Atlanta as you're heading to Savannah. And so I was in consultation with the boss and I said, it seems kind of counterintuitive for me to drive from Statesboro back to Atlanta. And then a day later, drive from Atlanta down to the, the mother-in-law's place. And because that's a four hour drive from Atlanta to South Alabama, down to the other L.A. 
And so she's like, yeah, you're right. So just kind of work your way from Statesboro down toward the mother-in-laws and I'll see you down there on Friday. So I'm like at a midpoint between Statesboro and LA. And so I'm about two and a half to three hours away from the mother-in-laws and that's where we're gravitating towards. So it was, it was, it was better to start working my way South as opposed to go North to go South. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 It's just, like I said, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, you know me, I'm a half bubble off plum anyway. So, um, all right. So we've talked to Easter candy and, and, and you've, you've, by the way, you've lit up the Twitch pitch, by the way, you, you've lit up. A, <laughs> a, a uh, yes, I was driving 40 miles an hour, Abby, uh, especially on two lane roads where you were having other folks who were driving other things other than cars, uh, open cup. What are some of your memories? about open cup and the the all-inness of, of the tournament what are some of your memories about open cup that's different? i've never played open cup no no oh no. wow not yeah. in any incarnation of you nope nope yeah i would say uh I, I believe it probably still is today open cup is i i think it's almost like the copa mx when we had in mexico it's kind of giving an opportunity uh, and a chance to uh for maybe players that, that, that haven't been playing regularly within the regular season um, and gives them an opportunity to kind of, you know, whether it's shine their way through to the first team or, or get an opportunity with, uh, with the, with the starting crew at one point, just to see if they're, they're ready. Um, but I, I, I mean, I guess, I guess that's maybe a good thing that I never played open cup. Well, but if you played Copa MX, it's the, along those same lines where you you have uh, these clubs, regardless of division, they want to knock off the big guy, those kinds of things. So, what was it like in that tournament for you playing? You know, being yeah, in that most definitely. And I, I think I think it goes back to what I what I just said. You know, um, for me, Copa MX when I did play it when it was around, it was an opportunity for me to kind of show why I deserve to be there and kind of hopefully be a stepping stone into the starting eleven. Um, or, or just to, you know, have the opportunity to be called upon, have my name called upon when, when ready, um, from, from the head coach. Right. And so it, it gives, I believe it gives the head coach, uh, an opportunity to look at players and say, okay, I can count on this guy. If I ever need to throw him in the mix or throw him in the den, uh, within a first team game. And, you know, I think, uh, MLS teams from what I've seen in the past, usually see it that way until maybe the quarter semis and finals, um, <laughs> Or to the 70th minute when they're down a goal yeah. and they've got to bring guys yeah. in. But I mean, I think it's a it's a great way because I mean, you look at yeah, you look at examples of Brandon Vasquez, who I believe you know played extremely well within the Open Cup, open and cup you know, Brandon Vasquez. Uh, and, and you look at you look at things like that, and you say, okay, I mean, even though I was never a part of it, but it gives a great way for younger players to kind of uh, you know not necessarily build a name for themselves, but kind of just be in that mix of that break that breakthrough. Um, you know, if they ever needed, if there are ever needed within the first team, then, then they're there. Well, and at the same time with your mentees, you always talk about opportunity and you never know when that opportunity is going to be there. And this is one of those chances, whether in your case, it was Copa MX to sit there and you get tapped and you're like, yeah, okay, it's time to show what's going on. Or here in the, here in the States with the U S open cup, it's, it's all about opportunity and taking advantage of that opportunity. We, uh, I mean, the most two important words that I always use for parents and I also use for players is, you know, opportunity creates more visibility. Those are the, those are the most important two words that I think are, 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 you know, are a staple, uh, for any player out there. Right. And you look at these, uh, you know, second, third, fourth, whatever, how many divisions you can have within open cup. Um, and you have this player that might be playing in one of the bottom divisions and has the chance to play against a, an MLS team or a USL, you know, a championship team or whatever it may be. Um, you know, it gives them, it gives them an opportunity to create a way, uh, to, to have more visibility uh, upon themselves. So, um, if they, if they show well, and I'm sure there's probably players that have played an open cup and lower division teams and, and created opportunity for themselves to, to kind of uh, move up the ranks within league, within teams and, uh, create a name for themselves there. So, um, you know, I, like I said, it's, it's an opportunity to create more visibility for those types of players. When, and, and kind of taking the steering wheel and just steering into the other lane, Atlanta United, stylistically, you know, you, you go up against Red Bulls last week. How frustrating is it 
when you're going up against a team that you know who they are stylistically, you know what they're going to do, you know that they're going to play you know, a certain way, the ball's got cooties, I don't want to touch it, these kinds of things. When you're having conversations with mentees about teams that play certain ways and trying not to get frustrated knowing that you're going to be bashing your head against the wall for 90 minutes, what are those conversations like about, A, opportunity in these situations, and then, B, not – getting you know completely and totally just freaked out by what's going on around you knowing that red bulls are going to do a certain thing a certain way that's a that's a good question you know i think um whenever you face those teams to where you know uh you're going to have some trouble trying to break their defense down or um i, I always say try not to play in, into their into their hands right into their game um if you play a certain way and you're able to just really, you know, show what you have in, in, in regards to your playing style. Um, then, then that's what you should. That's what you should go with. Uh, there, there are there are moments where I do believe, you know, um, some games can be a chess match, right? Um, I mean, you look at. I, I kind of look at. I look at our game against, um, you know, against New York Red Bull in the 2018 playoffs, where we played them at home and we played to to our style and to our liking. And then when we got there, even though we were on a better aggregate and we had the, the aggregate with on our side, um, we, we played their game and we didn't we didn't want the ball. Right. Um, we wanted the ball as far as away as possible. Uh, and, and we wanted to see what they could create. And really, it was a, it was a great, you know, a great point taken and, and a great idea by Tata, because that was we were playing against a team that had rarely ever built out of the back, a team that had rarely and we gave them that leverage. We gave them that opportunity to do so, and it worked to our favor. Um, and and so I think there's different situations that you can look towards, and it's um, it's all about adaptation and and and, and understanding uh, with each other. So um, you know when we speak to younger players, uh, you know I always say if you have a certain playing style, never never let anyone take that away from you, um, whether it be individually or collectively, because that's what got you there in the first place. Um, but you know, as you get older, you, you, you do understand that there, there are certain adaptations. There are certain ways that you can work around, um, you know, being successful on the field. I know that a lot of folks, when they look at that first leg, they look at what Chris Armas did tactically that was so anti Red Bull and you guys took advantage of it. When you had that conversation and Tata says, we're going to play their way. We've got the three nil lead in the aggregate, but we're going to play their way. What was the first reaction like in the locker room? It's like, what's going on? Yeah, I know we've got to leave, but we're going to play like them. What was the reaction? Yeah, I, I've probably said it so many times before in, in interviews, and I might have even said it on the show, but I always recall I always recall one, one particular player in mind. It was Miguel Amiron, and Miguel was thrown on the left side with me. Uh, to help out because they were, you know, they they had they had a uh, I believe it was uh, Florian Below and um, I want to say who their right back was. I don't really recall right now. Um, but in that situation, I remember they just kept overloading my side, and I just remember Miguel telling me at the beginning of the game, "We'll just dump it on their side because they they're not going to know how to play out of the back." But I'll, I'll help you as much as I can. Um, and and that was uh, that was a great point for him to make because he did that the whole entire game. He was so responsible. Um, he helped me out defensively the whole entire game. I just remember finishing that game. And even though it was probably one of the ugliest games we had ever played collectively, um, but we were just so happy with each other. I mean, obviously we lifted the, the, the Eastern conference trophy, but I just remember right after the game going up to him and just, we, we looked at each other and, you know, that, that was, that was pure teamwork in regards to knowing, um, you know, that we had each other's back and, and, and even, even though it was a uh, playing style that we didn't maybe, uh, enjoy, but we we knew our role. We knew, and I think that's so important. And and Parky always talks about that um, within within you know a lot of the team the team environments and the team chats that we have uh, with Beyond Goals is is you know understanding your role uh, is so important. You know you you have to, and and that's that's a great game to where you have, in my opinion, the greatest player within the MLS at that point in time, uh, who understood a role that he could play that would be absolutely influential to his whole entire team. Um, and, and even though it was a dirty way and it was a, a, an ugly way, but he still played it out, um, you know, to a way that, that helped us win that trophy. When, when you're talking with mentees and I imagine that there are going to be those conversations that you have where there will be matches where you will suffer. I mean, 
and and that's a word that you, you will suffer in matches. You you will play against type. You will have to do things you're not comfortable with. What well, what's the what's the response from your mentees when you say, yeah, there'll be games where you suffer? Do they sit there? And then it might be a generational thing where they sit there and go, suffer. Yeah, right. And then when they experience it, they're like, oh yeah, he really was right that there was that there is suffering. Do you have these conversations with your mentees about games where they will suffer? I, I don't think necessarily about games. I think more so maybe about their trajectory, maybe yeah. about their um, their their youth career of suffering and, and moments where not necessarily and particularly games, because I think I think players do well enough to adapt to every situation that's around them, right? And that's one thing that I always tell parents is that you know you, you're not able to go into your son's or your daughter's body and perform for that person that person or that specific individual or that player is going to, you know, they're going to have the ability to figure it out, whatever it may be, right? At the end of the day, us as humans and us as players on the field, we're going to figure it out. Whether it's the right way, whether it's the wrong way, we're going to learn from our mistakes and our experiences, or we're going to, you know, figure it out the best way possible. And and, and that's, you have to let each and every player go through that. Um, you know, I, I always say, right, I, I want my, I want my kid to, to fail and, and, on the field, right? I want him to lose some balls on the field. I don't want him to break every kid's ankle whenever he gets the ball. I want him to to lose the ball to see what his reaction is, to see what his transition is, right? Um, because he'll adapt and he'll learn from that way. I think that's maybe that's more of the suffering that I speak about with with my mentees, yeah. and then also um, just more so within their trajectory, right? Um, you know, most most kids say most most kids really don't know what the word resilience means or perseverance. Um, and, and I think that's, that's huge. Uh, and, and I think one of the, one of the things that we have, uh, you know, we've been really touching base on and we've been able to have these, these conversations with the pros, um, these videos to where we're, we're uh, you know, interviewing uh, particular players. Uh, you know, we have Don Nagby, Julian Gressel. We just released one with John Gallagher. Um, we have a few other really cool ones that are coming up uh, in the near future. And it's, that's ex exactly what it's talking about. It's a talking about perseverance and resilience and understanding uh, that opportunity is key, but how to prepare and ready yourself um, with whatever hurdles and, and, and obstacles you have to go through, because it's not a, it's not a straight shot up. It's not, you know, there's, there's no straight line uh, to success. There's always going to be these uh, bumps in the road. And um, I think sometimes with kids and with our youth, uh, you know, I, I feel it's so important. The earlier that you can go through those bumps in the road, the, the, the better you will be in the long run. Um, and I think sometimes when things are handed to you in the best way possible, and then you, you experience that bump in the road, sometimes it's so hard to kind of climb your way back up, but that, that would be the suffering that I, I try and explain. And I give my personal stories and my, my personal experiences to those players. So they understand and they look, Holy moly. Okay. That, that guy's been through a lot, whether it be injury, whether it be failing, whether it be, you know, trialing so many different places and failing and, and they get a sense of it and they say, okay, if, if that guy did it right, if that guy, Greg Garza, who was an average player did it for so long, then, then, uh, then maybe I can do it. Uh, maybe I can do it as well. And, and in the conversations that you've had, whether it it's with Julian or Nagby or Gallagher, it's three guys that have gone through the U S collegiate system. And with Julian, it's a top pick uh, for Atlanta United. John Gallagher, another pick for Atlanta United, who's had to go through an expansion draft and he's had to have his life uprooted. And, you know, you go from uh, Atlanta United where you're, you know, uh, you're growing your game to a new franchise and having to start over. What's it like to, to get all of these different conversations and all these different angles and approaches from these uh, conversations that you're having with all these guys? That's what it's all about, right? Uh, I think when Mike and I had this idea of trying to understand how we could implement other mindsets within, you know, certain things that they've also gone through um, and, and why the mental game is so important and why, you know, um, you know, believing in your own ability, having the confidence, the commitment, the consistency that goes through of, you know, creating your own success in whatever it may be, whether it be soccer or not, um, you know, learning and, and, and picking these guys' brains, uh, I think has been extremely influential to a lot of the people who, who, who pay attention because um, we can only say so much, right? It's like when you hear something from mom and dad, it's like they say it over and over and over again. And then after a while, it means nothing. Right. And that's the truth. 
Um, but sometimes when you hear those stories and you hear different experiences from someone else, um, you know, I think that's the, that's the coolest thing whenever I'm on social media is that, you know, I, I, I want to watch those reels of Kobe Bryant or, um, you know, these guys who have failed and they have these, and, and I mean, some people do a great job of, um, putting the story together, but it's those, it's those stories of, you know, being obsessed with one thing and one thing only and working towards that goal and whatever goes through, or, or, you know, uh, there was just like the, the, you know, I just saw a real this morning when I woke up and it was, uh, the, the guy who had just completed a marathon, um, at the classico who has 70, 75% of his body, uh, d disability. Wow. Um, and he just completed a marathon and he was the, he was the one that gave the initial kickoff, um, at the classico game of Barcelona and Real Madrid. So I kind of went through his story. Um, he had just completed that marathon right before. And, um, you know, he was able to kind of shake all the players hands and, and, and do the initial kickoff. And like, you see things like that and, and it's, you know, it just gives you that extra bit of motivation to say, man, you know, I think especially for these players, right, that are these young players or they haven't experienced yet resilience, those are the types of messages that I want to send um, to, to these young players because that that to me is, you know, not necessarily suffering because even that that guy that, you know, that, that completed that marathon, he doesn't see his problem as, as, as being something that's suffering. Um, he sees it as an opportunity. So as an opportunity to show others and to show himself and to prove himself right over and over and over again. And that's that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about within uh, within going through the ranks of, of of our youth careers and within breaking into the first team or using the Open Cup as an opportunity to break in. Right? You 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 look at these opportunities and you don't say you don't complain. You don't think it's a way of suffering. You always view every little piece of opportunity as a one to um, kind of build yourself up and, and use that as a stepping stone. Yeah. Have you learned anything? Have you and Mike learned anything? that you may not necessarily have either known or realized about yourselves or about your environments in these interviews with, with Julian and Darlington and John, what have you learned anything about yourself or about those around you? Yeah. You know, it was, um, I, I, I was traveling yesterday and somebody took me to the airport and they, uh, we were talking about, you know, our, our, our careers. And I think now speaking with other players and even speaking with with a lot of other people, whether they be in the corporate world or whether they be in the professional, right, the pro professional environment, I think one thing that I've I've noticed is that, you know, I would say the, the, the word, you know, or the, the phrase of, of, of self-doubt, um, there's even guys that are at the highest level or even CEOs or, or right, all of these people who are at the highest of the, you know, they're at the peak. Um, and, and we have our next guest who, who will be on the conversations with the pros. He speaks a lot about self doubt and going through, you know, bouts of confidence. And, and, and it's crazy to see, uh, you know, and I'll give a little hint a guy who just recently signed his biggest contract in his career um, and, and has teams from all over the world. Uh, after him. So it's, you know, you, you look at, you look at situations like that and you say, man, how does this guy have or deal with self-doubt and how does he cope with it? Um, and, and that to me is the most interesting thing that I see because I relate to, right? I think my whole entire career was always this fear of failure, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, you, you look at, and I think it's pro will probably be instilled with me, um, <laughs> until I, until the day I, I have my last breath, but just that fear of failure within everything that you do. And I think that's, that's instilled, you know, in us as maybe as a, as a young kid or going through the ranks or, you know, always, I just look at it and, and, and I look back at my own career and I, I kind of learn from other guys that are, that, that go through the same thing. Um, and, and, you know, whether it be, I look back at the, the youth national teams and I always use that as, as my example. Right. And I was very fortunate to play, under 14s, which I was just about to turn 13 years old in the first camp in Boston to be on the under 14 national team. And then I, I never, I never got out of that cycle, right? I played every single age group of every single youth national team until the full team. Um, and, and I, I know there's very few of us that have done that. Um, I, I mean, I, I can only think of maybe a, a couple of names of guys that have gone through every single cycle. And I always played and I was never, uh, you know, I always played, I was on the, the starting 11 in every single age group. And so I think to myself, man, I, I kind of go back and I think to myself, 
even even then, even when I was a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kid, I still dealt with that fear of failure, that self doubt from a very young age of always wanting to perform uh, for my coaches or always wanting to perform for my family who has given me that opportunity or, you know, everybody that is kind of watching and has a, has this expectation. Uh, you still go through that fear of failure and that self doubt. And so I think one thing that I've learned and has been really interesting to learn is how other, and I, what I wanted to say with this is it's, it's interesting to see how other guys um, who are currently still consistently playing very well and have done very well for themselves, like Darlington Nagby, like Julian Gressel, like, you know, John Gallagher and all these other guys that, that we'll speak to is how, how do they cope and how do they deal with that self-doubt and that fear of failure. And I think that's something that I learned, right? Um, even though I went through it, the, it, but we all go through it in different ways. Um, and whether it be in, in my case, whether it be journaling or for them, whether it be just getting away from it mentally, or, you know, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see and learn from these guys that, you know, are our fellow teammates and, and, and comrades that, that, that do the exact same thing, but to see, to see how they um, go through those things to me is extremely interesting. Because fear of failure can be one of two things. It can be that motivator or it can be something that hovers over you and has you perpetually chasing shadows. And that's a delicate line to cross when it comes to, to dealing with it, because, you know, you take one step one way and it can send you to the other side of the aisle just as quickly <coughs> if you're trying to if you're trying to to, to treat it as that positive. One moment can send you to the to the negative side of the aisle just as quickly when it comes to dealing with it, though. Most definitely, you know. Um, I, I think maybe if I look back at my youth career and I look back at every every stepping stone and every you know part or obstacle or my trajectory of kind of being at that that top level, um, right? And I guess I can be very fortunate. I can say I played at the highest level from the age of. 12 years old and I never got out of it. Um, and, and every rank and every youth rank until, until becoming a pro. Um, and then doing that, you know, having that sustainability, even as a pro in every highest rank. And I think to myself, man, maybe that fear of failure and that, you know, that, that, that level of accountability kind of, you know, held myself responsible and everything that I did was towards that. Um, and I always say there's this, there's this guy, that, you know, I give this to my mentees all the time. As I remember when signing with Tijuana and I had just gotten there and there was a guy named Juan Pablo Santiago and he played for Santos, represented the national team a few times, um, you know, was very successful, won a ton of championships. And I remember he drove me home one day from, from one of our scrimmages. I didn't have a car yet. And he was about 35, 36 years old. And today he's the, he's the director for, for Club Tijuana. He's one of the directors. Um, and he was just about to retire, but he, he told me this, he said, Greg, you know, I know, I know, I know you're a great kid, super responsible. He said, I always give this advice. And, 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 you know, he said, everything that you do before training will, will determine how successful you are during training and everything you do after training, whatever decision you make and whatever you do after training will determine how successful you are tomorrow. And man, that stuck with me for forever, right? Been, and it, whether it was understanding that our body was, my, you know, our, our temple or the decisions that we made or everything that I thought to myself, okay, when I wake up, I got to drink a glass of water. When I wake up, I got to do this. I got to do my, my prehab, my stretching, my, you know, see the, the massage therapist, see the chiropractor, all of these different things. Okay, that's going to that's gonna make me successful in training. And then everything that I did after, right? How much rest I got, how... All of these other different little things that kept me, you know, accountable. Um, it was a great, great piece of advice. And, um, you know, I was able to kind of use that throughout the rest of my career as well. All right. So before you go and a uh, question from the Twitch pitch this morning from Parzival, how do you motivate the players that have natural talent and have never had to try to improve and not develop a complex? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's really funny because my kids – my, my, my son just turned 10 today. So he woke up this morning and I, I mean, he woke up before me and I walked in the, the, the living room and he was watching Thunderstruck on TV, uh, which is, which is a really lame and crappy movie on Netflix, but it's uh it's about <laughs> ki a kid who gets KD's powers. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. Um, yeah, when KD was like big time. Right. And I mean, he's still big time, but when he was with the thunder, 
Um, and it's called Thunderstruck. And and when he, as he hands the kid the ball and the kid gets his powers, it's so funny. It stuck to me. And that's that's kind of cool that that, that question came out. Um, he said, hey, you know, hard work, right? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard enough, right? And that, that's such a great line, right? Because hard work, will, in my opinion, will always, it doesn't matter how talented you are, right? But talent will never be able to, to, to outwork, right? The hard work that you put in. Um, and I'm hoping I said that right, but you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's such a great line to look at because there's so many, I, I can look at my son and say, man, my 10 year old son is extremely talented. Right. And, and not because I'm just his dad, because he has something special about him, uh, that, that just stands, it stands out. Right. Yeah, but, but, but at the same time, I can look around, and I can say, holy crap, there's, there's a lot of talented kids out there, right? Their talent is, you know, is an excessive um, amount of, of talent within the world that we live in today, right? And, you know, uh, it, that's where that hard work and that will, that desire, that passion, that want, uh, that's, that's where, that's where those, those talented players have to understand that motivation has to come from that. Look at the, look at the guy next to you and say, okay, this guy's here. He's not as talented as me, but he works a lot harder than me. So how can I use that as, as that extra piece of motivation? And that's something that we try to implement and teach our, our, our players if they have that talent. All right. So one quick question. I know we're in stoppage time with you. One quick question. Uh, uh, Atlanta United playing in the Bronx in that band box. We've talked about adaptation and adjustment today. What's it like playing on that U12 pitch there in the Bronx? I think what's, I said you got that? that. You got that. You got that. U twelve. You got that nine v nine. Did you get that from me one time? <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, yeah, probably. I mean, it's it is a yeah. universal. Um, okay, I will now. say this is my this is my. I'm gonna give my guess of what the score is gonna be, and I'm gonna say it's gonna be nine to six. We're gonna win. <laughs> All right. <laughs> because I feel like those games can either be just a zero zero regular match, or they just outrageously high scoring numbers i'd like you know that's a great stat to look up to what stadium has gotten scored on what stadium has the most goals scored in that that's that's there there you go i, I bet you uh whoever comes on next on the show hopefully you can have the answer um but uh nice. yeah <laughs> i know i know i'd like uh, he, he'd be jason would definitely be the guy to know that answer but i i guarantee it's got it's got to be it's got to be it's got to be the Bronx, the 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 stadium, uh, the Yankees. It's got to be because there's. I just feel that you know those score lines just run up so easily. And it can go back and forth. It can go either way. Um, I I personally believe that the the playing in that stadium, there is no adaptation because this is just my personal opinion. I think it's just a flip of a coin um, of, okay. of of whoever can win. Um, I don't I I don't even think New York has. A, a leading advantage playing in that stadium, honestly. Um, I, I think it's just always a flip of a coin. Whoever whoever brings a little bit more that day will, will win. Uh, there is no chess match in that game. There is no tactics in that game. It's just whoever plays better in the whole entire week. If I were the coach, I would just play small-sided games the whole entire week uh, and, and see if it would work out. All right, so let's see. Let's see if Jason has the. Uh, let's see if Jason has the answer to the question. Probably not. <laughs> What's up, Greg? What's uh, up, we're, Max? We're, we're we're wrapping up with Greg on the Friday free kick, and Greg's question to the floor was: Is Yankee Stadium the place where the most goals are scored in matches in Major League Soccer hmm. since its inauguration? Since its inauguration. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I wonder what the difference would be actually between Yankee Stadium and the Benz. Yeah, there's been a lot of goals scored at the Benz, but yeah. I, I truly believe if I can think of like, what if they're like their first year of inauguration, wasn't it against like, uh, was it against Red Bull to where the score was like six to four or six to five? They, right? it was like an they had the game. Red Wedding game where they lost like seven nil. Um <laughs> They had a high scoring one in there as well. Like the first year, they weren't all that great at home. They were, yeah. you know, like a, around a 500 team anyway in 2015. But since then, they've been maybe them and the Red Bulls, I think, are honestly the two best home teams in the really? league. Yeah. Wow. So then you just proved me wrong right there. I said it was always just a flip of a coin, whoever wins there. No, they're they so good. Advantage. 
Yeah, it's it's the advantage, but it's also like they're good. You know, they've yeah. been good. They, um, they've always they've always had a good team, right? I always say, in my opinion, I, I would say they always have to have the best team because you have Etihad behind your back, right? You can just get players from loan. You look at you know, look at all the players that they had in the past. Um, you know, what's what's this? Uh, what's the Venezuelan, the center mid? Uh, her, was the last name? Oh, Herrera? Yonhel Herrera. Yeah. Yes, God, he was, he was an so absolute. Good. I mean, unbelievable. I remember seeing him the first game we played against them in New York. And thinking to myself, okay, this kid's going to be big. Yeah. Um, but I mean, he was a he was an on loan Etihad player, right? Mm-hmm. From uh, from City, right? So you you like they have a cheat sheet, right? Pretty yeah. much, <laughs> it's just how they use it um, to to kind of build their team. Yeah, and that's the question I, I think for them going forward is you look at it, and I'm sure we'll get into it here a little bit. Like Chano is getting up there, so they they've got to get another center back uh, to right. go with Tiago Martins, and they've got to solve the number nine. And, and yeah. do they do they do that more from like maybe the Manchester City side of things? Is there somebody in Manchester that they can loan over, or is it coming from one of the other CFG clubs? And they've done yeah. a lot with Uruguay, and Rodriguez yes. is a prime example of that. Is, is there another kid coming through down there yeah. that they bring up who's young and maybe needs a little bit of adjustment time, but is a great player? How many teams does uh, do you know what the teams are that Etihad owns? Oh, I can't Sorry, remember. We're like super stop. We're super stoppage time now. Jeff. No, no, <laughs> it's all good. Um, I know Thanks. Melbourne over in Australia. Um, okay. They've got uh, Montevideo City in Uruguay. Torque. Um, man, I want to say they've got six or seven worldwide. Yeah. Okay, yeah. here we go. Here's the list. 100% ownership Manchester City. NYC, they've got 80%. 100% yep. Melbourne City. 100% mm-hmm. Montevideo City, Torque. 100% Troy in, in the French. In French, yeah. Uh, 99% yeah. Lommel SK. 65% Mumbai City FC. Wow. 47% in Girona. That's right. 29.7% uh, Sichuan Junyu FC. 20% Yokohama uh, Mariners, 80% yeah. in Palermo, 90% in Sporte Club Bahia, plus their City Football Academy. But really, when you, okay. when you get into that list, though, from an NYC perspective, like what can help you? It, it's, For sure. it's the Uruguayan club. It sure. is maybe Girona, although I was gonna, like, you, know, you sent Tati there. I, that's what I, I, the only reason I asked that question is because Tati is not having the greatest of, of seasons. Um, yeah, that so, club isn't really. I know. Yeah, they're they're on. You know, and so I would say maybe that maybe that's a way to bring him back to NYC. Don't I, if I if I oh, if I no. call that next year next year Tati might be back at New York City FC. He might be uh, back in the summer. I mean, yeah. like that that's not crazy. If if they get through the year and it's like eh, this isn't really the best fit for him, we'll get yeah. him somewhere else in in the winter window next year. But yeah, six months back at New York City, let's do it. Maybe. All right, guys. I like I like you guys. I gotta I gotta go get the day ready for my son. Go go spend the birthday with your son. Thanks for hanging out with us. You know, we can talk soccer all day long, man. Oh yeah. All right. Be good, Greg. I'll see see you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye bye.